I will illustrate this with examples because that is the best way to explain what I mean. Let me begin with Mahatma Gandhi. The man who more than anyone denied us the truth, denied us the ability to be critical of the people and the things he loved, denied us the courage to be critical of religion, denied us catharsis itself. And let me issue my criticism of the Mahatma by employing a Brahmastra in the shape of a man who the Mahatma feared most above anyone else, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. Nations aren't inspired through sharing ancestral genes. They aren't shown the righteous path through gene pool commandments. Nations need purity of the mind more than that of the heart. Nations need catharsis. Our nation hasn't had this catharsis. This is because we chose to follow the grey and not the black and white. We chose to follow the road traversed by Mahatma and not Ambedkar. To put it bluntly, Mahatma Gandhi was a man of grey. Ambedkar of black and white. And history shows that men who prefer the black and white are hated by all. Because let us be honest here, this world runs on grey. Grey allows to wash our sins after we have committed them. It allows us to be forgiven. Grey allows us to worship and be worshipped. Grey is actually religion. Gandhi was not a liberal. His beliefs on societal structure, on economy, on a concept state, on what Indians should eat or drink, would make even the most ardent of conservatives blush. His theories were based less on logic and more on a bizarre sense of faith-based entitlement. They can only be described as an inseparable emulsion of homeopathy and spirituality. Gandhi was an intelligent and cunning godman. He was made for India. He held her pulse, pumped her heart. Ambedkar, on the other hand, was the only true liberal this nation has produced in the last many centuries. Gandhi was a theologian, pretending to be a politician. Ambedkar, a supreme scholar. Gandhi was a social Darwinian. Ambedkar, a Darwinian. Gandhi said he would not, quote, weep over the disappearance of machinery, unquote. Ambedkar wanted an industrialized India. Gandhi could have ruled independent India had he chosen to for as long as he wanted. Ambedkar lost an election by some margin, twice. Gandhi saw the village as India's liberator. Ambedkar called it a cesspool and a den of ignorance. Gandhi's self-confidence was buttressed by the blind devotion of his countless followers. Ambedkar's stemmed from his ability to speak his mind, stand all by himself and appease no one. Gandhi had an army of men. Ambedkar was a one-man army. Ambedkar saw through Gandhi. Worse, the Mahatma gauged this, understood this, realized this, but like a stunned ostrich, pretended to hold fort employing his bulwarks, his minions, who were also petrified of Ambedkar's intellect. India has forever been a land of such tragedies. The one who truly was a Mahatma fought a man pretending to be one and lost. When the Great War, the First World War that is, when the Great War ended with the disbanding of the Ottoman Empire, Gandhi persuaded the Congress to support the Khilafat movement. A violent agitation for restoration of the Islamic Caliphate deposed by the victorious British. Before long, Gandhi pinched his nose and plunged into the murky waters of religious appeasement and terror rationalization in the wake of the ghastly anti-Hindu violence perpetrated by the Malabar Muslims or Moplas in 1921. Ambedkar, who saw Gandhi's advocacy of the Khilafat movement as a Quote, pernicious political stunt. The movement was started by the Muslims. He said it was taken up by Mr. Gandhi with a tenacity and faith which must have surprised many Muslims themselves, unquote. Ambedkar viewed the Mopla rebellion as nothing but jihad. The Muslim agitators, he said, quote, preached the doctrine that India under the British government was Daral Harb. 
the aim was to establish the kingdom of Islam by overthrowing the British government. Knives, swords and spears were secretly manufactured. Bands of desperados collected for an attack on the British authority. On 20th August, a severe encounter took place between the Moplas and the British forces at Pinmangdi. Roads were blocked, telegraph lines cut and the railway destroyed at a number of places. As soon as the administration had been paralyzed, the Moplas declared the Swaraj had been established. A certain Ali Mudliyar was proclaimed Raja. Khilafat flags were flown and Arnad and Valurna were declared Khilafat kingdom. As a rebellion against the British government, it was quite understandable. But what baffled most was the treatment accorded by the Moplas to the Hindus of Malabar. The Hindus were visited by a, a dire fate at the hands of the Moplas. Massacres, forcible conversions, desecration of temples, foul outrages upon women such as ripping open pregnant women, pillage, arson and destruction. In short, all the accomplishments of brutal and unrestrained barbarism were perpetrated freely by the Moplas upon the Hindus until such time as troops could be hurried to the task of restoring order through a difficult and extensive tract of the country. This was not a Hindu-Muslim riot. This was a massacre. Unquote. These are words of not me but Ambedkar. To Ambedkar's horror, Gandhi laid the blame squarely on the Hindus. Hindus, said the Mahatma, must find out the causes of the Mopla fanaticism. They will find that they are not without blame. They have hitherto not ca cared for the Moplas. The outbreak would not have taken place if the collector had consulted the religious sentiments of the Moplas. Unquote. The last time you heard this in contemporary India was the ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Kashmiri Hindus. They were blamed for it. Had they not been successful, had they not held all the government jobs in Kashmir, this ethnic cleansing would not have happened. The genesis is of Gandhi and talking of Mopla riots that none of us knew. That religious sentiment as analyzed by Ambedkar was jihad. Indeed, Muslim leaders themselves agreed with Ambedkar. Maulana Hasrat Mohani, the eulogized freedom fighter and a friend of the Mahatma, who once had coined the slogan Inkalab Zindabad, justified the massacre of Hindus by saying that this was Islamic Jihad and that according to the rules of Jihad, those who help the enemy become enemies themselves. Shockingly, Gandhi was conciliatory towards the Maulana. Quote, there is no greater nationalist nor a greater lover of Hindu-Muslim unity than the Maulana. Unquote. Even if one side is firm in doing its dharma, said Gandhi, there will be no enmity between the two. So it is more necessary for a Hindu to love the Mopla and the Muslim more when the latter is likely to injure him or has already injured him. Why should a single Hindu have run away on account of the Mopla's atrocities? Unquote. This was sheer lunacy. The Mahatma was beseeching the Hindus to hold their ground even as they were being hunted down and butchered in their thousands. One could quote more, much more, of this utterly reprehensible apologia from the Mahatma's playbook, were it not so tormenting. Of little comfort is the fact that the saint continued to hold such views despite condemnation by men like Ambedkar. Decades later, in 1947, while preaching to those affected by the pre-partition Hindu-Muslim violence, he said, and I quote, Hindus should not harbor anger in their hearts against Muslims, even if the latter wanted to destroy them. Even if the Muslims want to kill us all, we should face death bravely. If they established after killing us all their rule, after killing all Hindus, we would be ushering in a new world by sacrificing our lives. None should fear death. Birth and death are inevitable for every human being. Why should we then rejoice or grieve? 
if we die with a smile being killed by muslims we shall enter into a new life we shall be ushering in a new india unquote ambedkar was incensed at gandhi's selectivity more so of his stand on the mopla massacre quote mr gandhi has never called the muslims to account even when they have been guilty of gross crimes against hindus unquote said ambedkar mr gandhi has never protested against such murders of prominent hindus like swami shraddhanand rajpal nathuramal sharma not only have the muslims not condemned these outrages but even mr gandhi has never called upon the leading muslims to condemn them he has kept silent over them such an attitude can be explained only on the ground that mr gandhi was anxious to preserve hindu muslim unity and did not mind the murders of a few hindus if it could be achieved by sacrificing their lives unquote another incident around the same time brought to life or light the differences between ambedkar and mahatma gandhi underscoring further the gap that exists between objectivity and selectivity and how the latter is used to devastating effect in politics it was the publication of a pamphlet called rangila rasool written as a retaliation for sita ka chinala a book penned by a muslim that claimed lord rama's wife sita was a prostitute ambedkar stood for mahashe rajpal the publisher of the pamphlet rangila rasool who was assassinated by a muslim fanatic ilmuddin this while mohammad ali jinnah defended ilmuddin in court and none other than the so called great poet alama iqbal carried ilmuddin's coffin at the funeral ambedkar was outraged at what was done to rajpal gandhi was outraged at what rajpal did quote i am no defender of the author of rangila rasool said gandhi adding that the book gave him deep pain he called the book offensive and its author a mischief maker he wanted the law changed the law changed in came the dreaded ipc 295a calling for punishment for those who hurt religious sensibilities and the india of the kind ambedkar had imagined an india proclaiming liberty and freedom of expression called in our hindu vedas changed forever for the worse incidentally in this poster is written ajmer there is a 21 year old engineer called sunny gupta he was thrown in jail for 45 days the news only came out after he emerged from the jail so no one could even outrage on what has happened and what was his crime he was charged under the same section 295a that came into being after gandhi outraged on rangila rasool and what was his crime for which sunny was charged all he said was that hindus should not visit ajmer that is all he said that sentence offended religious sensibilities of the muslims sunny gupta was charged under 295a and he was thrown in jail for 45 days his life was ruined do we know any of this do we know of these views of the mahatma do we know that ambedkar called him the prophet of a dark age a charlatan someone who bared his fangs worse our knowledge of mahatma gandhi is embellished through that ridiculously selective propaganda film called gandhi and how every indian almost danced in the aisles when gandhi got oscars <laughs>